are we defining satiety as just the desire to continue eating or is there more to it than that? You don't want to be malnourished with, you know, zero calcium and that food will taste unappealing because it's got none of the nutrients, olive oil or butter, or, you know, you might think it tastes great for a couple of teaspoons, but you're going to get really palate fatigue is going to kick in really quickly with anything that's very nutrient poor. Hey there, I wanted to let you know about my latest book, Body Confident, that's coming out in September 2024. Call it a critical thinking guide to your health journey because it is a framework, a guide, a blueprint that's going to help you understand and be able to filter all the information that's out there on the internet that you're getting from social media, YouTube, go to bodyconfidentbook.com, sign up for updates, the book comes out in September. All right, guys, it's Coach Bronson here. And today I have the Honorable Marty Kendall on. Honorable. Um, honorable. <laughs> Marty, no, I have the honor and the pleasure to have a conversation with Marty, who we haven't talked. It's almost been three years, it's I think, since the last time we talked, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been hiding. Good to chat, dude. I'm trying to stand in the rock and not, not make you know too much noise. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so for a little bit of background, Marty and I connected a few years ago when I was first kind of getting into this, trying to learn as much as I could about nutrition. And I was introduced to you through Ella Bruce yep. and the stuff that she was yeah. doing, did some She's interviews with her. Smart lady. Yes, very smart. I, I don't know where she is, but if you talk yeah. to her, tell her she needs to pop back into She's the world someday. Off, off the radar. She's actually yeah. been off the radar. <laughs> and, uh, but you're doing some really crazy cool stuff with uh, data mining yep. is it are you at the point where it's you can call it big data yet it, i've got a million days and it's crashing yeah. my computer and for the last month yeah. i've been waiting <laughs> just sitting there waiting for my computer to grind doing the analysis so, yeah. so it's so big you, enough to, so to tell everybody a little bit about what you're doing because the work that you're doing with nutrient optimizer um and basically really trying to understand to a level that I don't think anybody's done before, mm. how food impacts our habits. Yeah. And right? how much that's how eat. I like I, to describe it. How much we eat, yeah. how much, you know, when we stop yeah. eating, yeah. craving, satiety, all that stuff. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's give us a little I mean, rundown on that first. Craving, satiety, uh, why do we all seem to overeat in our modern environment is such a mm -hmm. fascinating fundamental question that I think everybody's trying to get at. and. Kevin Hall's been looking at ultra processed food and there's something about ultra processed food that makes us overeat it and we eat more of it and we store more of it. And why is that? And, and like yeah. this ultra processed food definition is a, a bit nebulous. It's like, yeah, don't, don't eat things with 20 ingredients in the label, but maybe the protein bar, yeah, not as bad as the McDonald's, you know, Big Mac and fries and Coke with that. And what is the differentiator? And I've been trying to get through the dogma my wife is type 1 diabetic so and my son as of 18 months ago and so this stuff matters to me yeah i grew up in a sda family um seventh adventist and uh which is the, the hub of nutritional diet dogma so i understand what diet dogma and belief-based nutrition is from the inside mm -hmm. and i just see all these polar opposite approaches online that people swear by and they thrive and it's like what is the unique factors Ooh. that's that span across all these different diets that make them work for people why are people so passionate about vegan yeah carnival low carb keto you know mediterranean what, what are the unique factors that make people mm -hmm. feel satisfied with what they eat so, I'm, gonna, so I'm an engineer, so I want to understand that with data. I was like, yeah, give me the so data, gonna, show me the data, gonna, I'll believe the data. Okay, I'm going to put a little spoiler out there for anybody listening <laughs> or watching. Uh, my new book that's coming out, Body Confident, which we haven't talked about yet, Marty, but there's yeah. a big piece of it. And I actually introduced this concept. I, I don't know if I introduced the concept to the world, but I yep. introduced the concept for my content in my last book, Ultimate Ketogenic yep. Fitness, yep. where I break down the three core requirements for good nutrition yep. being nutrient density, bioavailability, yep. and satiety. Yep. And I got a lot of Love that it. information that I de that helped me define that from you. Yeah, thank you. So when we talk about what are the core things, what are the things yep. that go across all the different protocols of nutrition that have to be in place in order for that protocol to work? Yep. I think those are the three things that we're looking at. Yeah. Is that yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, bioavailability is such a, we know animals are better than plants in a lot of things and some mm -hmm. things, but other things that don't matter. And 
you know, phytates will inhibit calcium absorption and a few minerals and it gets a bit murky, but other things, it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, definitely a, a meat, seafood, dairy-based diet, getting most of your calories from that is excellent um, because yeah. it, those nutrients are bioavailable. But sometimes if you're only eating muscle meat there's a number of nutrients that you know may be very low and 100 percent of very low is still very low 100 percent of zero is mm -hmm. still zero so mm -hmm. it's like um maybe maybe like we can chill out about the bioavailability a little bit and make sure we're getting plenty of everything in our diet and then the approach we take with our optimizers is uh, if there's nutrients like omega-3 or whatever that you're not that are very low in your diet then hey is that bioavailable then it matters yeah. if you're getting tons and tons of vitamin a which most people are then who cares if it's coming from liver or sweet potato or carrots it's, right. it doesn't really matter something you just said and this might take us off on another tangent but we'll try to come back <laughs> this, this could be a long interview man. Just goes a whatever, tangent. Yeah. we're gonna go all over the place something you just said kind of triggered a thought if because when we talk about the dogma in the space. Yep. If your vitamin C is low, that's okay because you're carnivore. It doesn't matter if your vitamin C is low because you don't need as much. Uh, yeah, but maybe. Right? maybe. What are your, what are your thoughts that, on those types well, of I, arguments? I've been, looking at, I've been looking at the data for low carb versus low fat, particularly with vitamin C and calcium mm -hmm. actually just this morning. And it seems we've got like in, in the general million days of data or 620,000 days of data that I've got micro data for from people all over the world like there seems to be a craving for foods that contain vitamin c and when we get enough we eat less so once we push it above that bliss point we eat less for the low carb data it seems that, that bliss point is a lot lower rather than 80 milligrams per 2000 calories you're only looking at about eight milligrams per 2000 calories so it seems you hit a that bliss point maybe earlier and so maybe the needs are a little bit lower and getting above that with more vitamin C per calorie is uh, more satiating at that point. But I mean, we've got craving data from people who are eating meat on boats at sea yeah. for two years and it's the old, it's not the, I just killed a woolly mammoth and I'm <laughs> drinking the blood and getting all the minerals and all the nutrients in the right, blood and right. all the viscera. It's, you know, old aged meat yeah they get off the boat and eat anything and everything to get sure. vitamin c it sure. seems so scurvy was the first thing that was not that i want to bang on about scurvy and vitamin right. c but yeah there, there does seem to be a slight difference but i think there's still a need for those nutrients vitamin c calcium yeah absolutely Although the, the minimum yeah. requirement is slightly different it seems but not significantly okay and so from the data that you're saying you can kind of uh, I don't know, predict, gauge, evaluate, yeah. you know, people in this camp or group of, uh, pro let's say profile, profile yeah. of, of nutrition habits and choices um, yeah. tend to get more or less. And do you also have any data that correlates their status of health? Are you, no, are you doing any surveys a, or questionnaires a, like that kind of go with the data you're collecting on the nutrition side? Yeah, so, so what I've done, I've got data from our optimizers, which is 160,000 days of data. We've yeah. got a little bit of data on that. And if I wanted to mine into it, I could and look at individuals. But then there's the NHANES data, um, which is the average US American, how they eat. And then I got mm -hmm. the UN FAO data set, which is 300,000 days of data from low and middle income countries. So this is all over the world, Cameroon, a lot from Brazil, that sort of thing. So it's like, how do people eat across the world? And I, okay. I want to know what are the satiety factors, what nutrients, if we strip away the names, the vegan, plant-based, carnivore, keto, ketovore, you know, whatever we want to call it, if we strip away the names, what are the nutrients we're craving in food? So no, to go into individual health status, I don't have that data and yeah. I don't think I possibly could. Yeah, um, I can't imagine a, that would be, you would have to have, uh, that would have to be a funded, here's a yeah. subset of people we have the nutrition data for, we need to go back to those people. Yeah and and figure that out but i'm yeah, sure yeah, most the, of the, what you have is also anonymized so you don't even know who they are yeah. right 
yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and this is me, you know, I, I got a, I'm a curious engineer who quit his day job to burn through his retirement savings <laughs> to play with spreadsheets with numbers on nutrition. So, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a funded Stanford study, but I'm, right, uh, I'm right. pretty passionate about it. But it's interesting. And you have, a, you have a lot of groups that you run and you've, you've written a yeah. bunch of books or eBooks yeah. at least. Did you ever do yeah. like a published, get anything like on Amazon, uh, yeah. or Barnes and Noble? Big fat like keto lives went really well on uh, Amazon. Kindle, okay. it uh, went surprisingly. Okay. Yeah, blew up. A lot of people found us through that. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, good information, man. Um, yes. Tell us, if you could, the, the, a couple, two or three of the most interesting things that you learned in this process about nutrition, about people, about mm. the data, whatever. Yeah. I mean, the thing that's really excited me and blown my mind recently is that we we crave nutrients and I think that's fairly well understood. We've talked about cravings and addiction. I'm addicted to food. I'm craving food and I just can't stop eating food. And you can think of, you know, we, we love sugar, but things taste too sweet. Like it's the gold of Dr. Zane. We love mm -hmm. salt. We love food that contains salt, but then it's, it's too salty and we eat less and you know, we love fat. It gives a great mouth feel. Um, but then it becomes greasy and, and you know, we don't love too, too much fat. Although some people yeah, want to live in 80% fat, but um, I don't think everybody needs to thrive, but we'll, we'll thrive there. And there's, but, but then there's the same sort of bliss point. Howie Moskowitz in the 60s started looking at the bliss point in army rations mm -hmm. and this inverted U-shaped curve to identify how much fat, sugar, salt they needed in different foods. And that revolutionized the ultra processed food industry. And like yeah. the, I'm reading fat, sugar, salt at the moment, completely enthralled. And it just goes through how Philip Morris bought Kraft and General Foods and all these big food manufacturers and just used the same addictive tactics. They saw the writing on the wall that the governments were coming after them for the cost of the medical expenses that the cigarettes were causing, you know, okay, we need to pivot and make addictive food. So they've formulated these addictive foods to just hit our bliss points perfectly. Yep. But the data shows that it's not just fat, sugar, salt, it's protein. It's, you know, there's an optimal energy density. It's not too high. It's not too low. There's, we crave calcium, we crave potassium. We seem to crave vitamin C, vitamin B2. These are all statistically significant satiety factors that when you bring them together you can get a much more accurate representation prediction of how much we're going to eat of a certain food versus another yeah. so that's just like eat, incredibly not eat so that you have to eat more right i mean yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like protein you can be very low protein people eat less on a very low protein diet and that sort of blew my mind and that is a thing if if you your food doesn't have enough protein. You get, yeah, it's not real food. I'm going to be malnourished. I'm, I'll, I'll wait it out till I can get a proper amount of protein. I'm going to binge the hell out of that because I'm Which so I protein is, deprived. I think it's very crazy to, uh, for people to understand that concept. You know, I've been talking, doing a lot more podcasts, trying to get back into inter doing more interviews. And the more people I talk to and the more clients and and subscribers and people out there in the world who are responding to the stuff I'm putting out, I'm the last six to eight months specifically, maybe even a year mm. has been, it seems an influx of people who are um, under eating protein yeah. and just under eating in general. And the, the, the amount of times that the two of those things go hand in hand is beyond a yeah. significant yeah, statistic yeah, yeah. in my yeah, opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, never like, hear somebody who's under eating, but they're getting all their protein and they're under mm. eating fat. Right. Mm. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm getting, you know, 120 grams of protein, but I'm only getting 10 grams of fat and 10 grams of carbs. That doesn't happen. Mm. Yeah. It's I'm getting 150 grams of fat and I'm yeah. only getting 60 grams of protein. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's things like that. That's what we get all the time because I wrote yeah. Big Fat Keto Lies and sort of decoded the downsides of hardcore keto and everybody comes to me going, you know, I believe the keto thing and tried to chase ketones and overate fat. And now I just can't stop eating all that fat. I understand it, but I, I love fat. It's really tasty. Yeah. once you believe that, <laughs> yeah. that you can eat as much as you want, cause it doesn't raise insulin and won't get stored as body fat. You just, yeah, we don't have a break like we do for carbs and protein mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for fat when you overeat it.
Yeah, and, and an optimal, when we talk about macros, because uh, for the longest time, and again, you, I don't know if you realize how much your information redirected my direction, right? Redirected <laughs> me on my path. So it was a Thank long you. time that I, that, I, that I was under the impression, like a lot of people, that that protein was the most satiating macronutrient, right? And then listening to you, I was like, well, maybe what if it's protein and fat in the right combination? And yeah, it's not yeah. one or the other. Yeah, yeah. And we've right? talked about Maybe that before. Maybe they're not fighting you, with each other, you know? If, if you dial up the protein to 30 40%, you're sort of doing okay. But once you get to 50 60%, then you're going, I need need energy. I need, I'm hungry because mm-hmm. I'm just not mm-hmm. getting enough energy. So you need to find that sweet spot balance point. And we'll eat the most at 12.5% protein. So people in Nigeria who are getting 8% protein and 80% carbs are under eating because they're not getting quality food. Yeah. But yeah. if you get the average American is sitting around 12.5% protein, which is the f- perfect formula for hyper palatable junk food. And then if you just dial them up to 15, 20, 30%, then satiety kicks in, we eat less. And that means dialing back the fat, dialing back the carbs. It's not eating a ton more protein. How do you define getting good nutrition? Because we've talked, you've, you've said that a couple of times and in correlation to protein intake yep. is, and this is the kind of, this is kind of, this is not a leading question at all, Marty, is protein <laughs> intake more important to nutrition than fat intake? You need a balance between nutrients and energy and the yes. whole game is finding that right balance. So if you... Yeah, you obviously agree with that, but yes. uh, yeah, you need. <laughs> but if you've got more body fat on your on your body, and you've got yeah. more you pre diabetic, diabetic, you've got a whole lot of glucose stored in your body. What are you going to dial back? It's not the protein, mm-hmm. because you want to keep your lean mass. You want to dial back the the carbs and or the fat. Yeah. So you get enough protein without excess energy. So if you want to lose weight, then you you know how do I tweak back the carbs and fat? while getting enough protein. And, and that's the first part of the game. But then protein's important, protein's primary, but it's not the only thing. Potassium, sodium, calcium, vitamin C, B2, they're all statistically significant in the satiety yeah. equation. And that's what nobody else has seen before. Um, I, I love Robin Homer and Simpson and the protein leverage and their recent papers show that protein breakpoint, I call it a bliss point at about 10, 12% protein. But, you know, I'd love to publish this stuff to show that it's it's nutrient leverage, not just protein leverage. We need enough of all the nutrients. Well, do you see that carried out if you, and I don't know if you, I, I'm assuming with all the data that you have, is there a difference between the cravings or satiation quotient, I'll call it, I don't know if you use that term, I just made that up, yep. and... Um, between whole food sources of protein and processed, like protein shakes. Yeah, I mean, from right? a... because because of thinking, of, I'm just thinking whole food mm. sources. If I'm eating a steak, there's going to be things, yeah. other micronutrients in there that aren't in the shake. Yeah, the, there's two parts of that. One that I can't quantify is you know the the protein powder is effectively pre digested and just hits your bloodstream quickly, goes straight to your mm-hmm. muscles. And if you just did a big workout and you're a bulking bodybuilder who wants to get bigger and bigger and bigger that's a really good option to get the protein into the muscles quickly but if you're going for satiety then the whole food protein source that needs to be digested over eight ten hours is Mm -hmm. is a better option but from a nutrient density point of view yeah the the whole food protein source the meat the seafood the dairy will have a ton of other nutrients that you're also craving that come along with it and and you can't as i said protein's primary you need that but then once you're getting enough protein that you go well how do we get enough potassium and calcium and vitamin c and b2 and then once you've got those you just go well let's let's open it up to all 34 essential nutrients and that's the sort of icing on the cake that if you want to quantify it, that's what we take people through in our micros masterclass, which is a ton of fun a little bit nerdy for most so the best place to start is with the protein versus energy ratio okay yeah okay um you've said percentages yep. and you've said calories which triggers you i think it does it triggers me a little <laughs> bit um and you, we've, you've talked about calories so i asked you before because i didn't know if this is something that we could 
walk through here on the video, but yeah. I think it's it's a good thing to do. And um, anybody that's listened to me, you, and it's funny because I'm thinking about what, what we've just talked about. You've said calories, you've said percentages and ratios, yep. but then at the same time, you're also talking about um, protein energy balance. Yeah. Right. So it's like, wait a second. How do those? How does the? How do those concepts work together? So I know the data that you have is coming from the platform where you're pulling the data from, all that yep. information, calorie based. Yep. So you kind of have to do that. What is? What's that relationship there, and how you look at this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, the, the end goal of what I'm trying to achieve is not to count calories or to get to people to limit calories. It's to mm -hmm. change, give them an informed choice of what they eat to know that if I'm going to Macca's or KFC, those foods are designed to hit your bliss point perfectly. They're designed to make you buy more of them and eat more of them. And the, there should be no surprise that you probably won't have the body composition you want if you live at Pizza Hut and Macca's yeah. because... Yeah. They're not nutrient deficient. They've got the right amount of protein, fat, carbs, salt, potassium, calcium, B2, vitamin C to hit those bliss points and make you eat more. Mm -hmm. So they're engineered. So what I'm trying to do is move people past that bliss point to get a little more protein than the minimum, a little bit more calcium than the minimum. And that engenders satiety and people eat less. They naturally consume less energy, calories, matter, you know, atoms, whatever you want to call it, carbon, carbon bonds. There's so, many, <laughs> so much argument about how do yeah. we quantify energy that we eat. And, yeah, for sure, the calories are quantified in a bomb calorimeter. You blow up some food and see how much heat it produces and we're mm -hmm. not bomb cal calorimeters. But, unfortunately, that's the best measure we've got at the moment because that's all we can quantify we can't yeah say bronson eat these foods and we're going to measure your heat output but we yeah. do know that protein is more thermogenic um, than carbs and carbs are more th thermogenic than fat so for calorie for calorie ingested you're going to even if you oxidized all the protein you'd get a lot less energy because you're losing 15 to 35% mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. energy just in oxidation. But a lot of that energy in the little bunny quotes um, from protein just, you know, goes to rebuild your muscles. And then right. it's really right. the, the energy from the fat and carbs that is used to move around and, and what's yeah. the fat that's left over is stored. So it, it's imperfect, but I mean, you've got to work with the data you've got to, to get the outcome you want. Yeah, yeah, and that's it's it's an interesting discussion from where you're coming from because that's what you're comparing. That's what's in the data that you have, and yeah. that's what you're comparing. Yeah. So understanding the application of that doesn't a hundred percent translate. I'm sure that causes some challenges when you're talking to people about okay, now how do we take this information and apply it when yeah. we talk about now we're going to split the application of this to protein to energy rate, protein to energy yep. balance. Well, yep. if it's all calories, then why are we splitting out protein and energy? Yeah, I mean, you, you could say protein isn't an energy source, and then ah, you say, you know, I was hoping if, if, if you wanted to go there, <laughs> um, but but it can be oxidized if you if you're eating 500 grams of protein like mm -hmm. Sean Baker is, a lot of that is being oxidized as energy. So, it, how do we know how much of that is being oxidized versus? being stored as muscle on Sean, we, we don't. We, we don't know the point. He looks pretty jacked, but probably not 500 grams a day of muscle building. He's not getting, he's really big, but he's not building 500 grams of new protein on his body. So some of that is being used for energy and, and broken off. Um, yeah. So we're using an imperfect numbers, imperfect tool. We understand yeah. that. But when you see the satiety index ranks foods and at the top you've got you know, spinach, watercress, egg white, you know, these crazy foods that you look at them and go, I could never overeat that. If you put that mm -hmm. in front of me, I'd just be stuffed. And at the bottom, you've got everything on the, the McDonald's and Pizza Hut and Wendy's and Taco Bell menu. It's got, wow, this is this is pretty cool. Like, I think there's something here. Like a, yeah. a couple of days ago, I finally, after a month of crunching the numbers and trying to refine it, I think, I think I'm getting here. I put it into the spreadsheet with a thousand foods and you look at how it ranks them and you go, wow, this is, this is really cool. It shows people this will 
keep them full of whistless energy mm-hmm. calories, matter, carbon, carbon bonds, whatever Bronson wants to call it today or whatever people <laughs> want to call it on Twitter um, versus this will make me eat more of it, buy more of it and store more of it as yeah. fat and I'll become diabetic and obese and metabolic and healthy, whatever you want to call that. So what you just said, I think is going to, is, is a little intriguing. This list of most satiating foods mm. and you mentioned spinach and watercrust being at the top. How much are you going to eat, man? Right. So are we defining satiety as just the desire to continue eating or is there more to it than that? It, it, it's the properties in food that limit how much we can eat of it. Okay. So that could be so anything per, from I'm per tired calorie, of the flavor. It, it, I'm tired of yeah, the flavor. Well, I, th- I feel th- full. Think of, it as, think of it as like liver. How much liver do you sit down and eat? It's got a strong flavor. How None, much oysters? Because I hate liver. <laughs> well, whatever. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what's a strong tasting nutrient dense food that Bronson can't overeat? Yeah. Lamb. I like, I love lamb, but after a certain yep. point, I'm just done. Yeah, and lamb is great, but then maybe lamb kidney has got is even more nutrient dense, mm-hmm. which signals to your body, hey, that there's a lot of nutrition in here, not a lot of energy, so we only need a little bit of this food to get the nutrients we need from it, and let's just eat a bit of it and then chill out. So what you're trying to do is avoid that bliss point. You don't want to be malnourished with you know zero calcium, mm-hmm. and that food will taste unappealing because it's got none of the nutrients you need it's got none of the even if like you don't drink straight oil most people can't sit down and go i'm gonna for a week i'm gonna eat nothing but olive oil or butter or you know you might think it tastes great Mm -hmm. for a couple of teaspoons but you you know you're gonna get really palate fatigue is gonna kick in really quickly with anything that's very nutrient poor but if you can get past that bliss point if you can get the 30 percent protein or the you know 1.2 1.2 grams of calcium or you, those foods start to taste stronger and there's a natural appetite break. You hit sensory mm-hmm. specific satiety on not just one nutrient, not just protein, but all the nutrients. And and that's what Fat, Sugar, Salt, book by Michael Moss that's blowing my mind at the moment, he went through and they looked at why they, they paid a Swiss chemist who was an expert in flavors and odors to understand why mm. coke was so amazing and pe- why mm-hmm. people just kept drinking it and it's just completely unremarkable it just tastes pleasant but it's not too strong there's yeah. a balance between the the sodium and the and the and the sugar and all the other flavors that doesn't hit any flavor too hard so you can just keep on drinking it you don't go oh that that was a bit too strong i'm gonna stop mm-hmm. it just has a perfect balance and and the ultra processed food has a a perfect balance of all the different nutrients that helps us to keep overeating yeah. them so if we can so, push it past that bliss point then you're gonna stop sooner so i'm trying to to think about what the takeaways are for people listening with this, <laughs> this bliss po- with the bliss point thing and that is if we're eating something that is nutrient dense, we're going yep. to exactly. be less inclined to eat as much. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you can, you, if we have something that is less nutrient dense, then we're likely going to eat more. You're going to binge the hell out of the things that are designed to hit all your bliss points at the same time. So ultra processed food, they're not nutrient poor. They've got just enough nutrients to light up all your dopamine centers to go. It's got this nutrient and this, this is great. And it's got a whole lot of energy and fat and, and salt and everything all at the same time. But you need to push past it to nutrient density to, but if you do to that switch with off ultra- your cravings. Right. But if you do that with ultra processed foods, then you're, you're also getting the extra fuel calorie. You're getting the fuel macros that come with you're it. You're overeating atoms of carbon, carbon bonds or whatever Bronson yeah. wants to call it. Some people call yeah. it calories. <laughs> yeah. Calories for, for the, for the, for those people who may be new to my, to my channel. Okay. <laughs> and that's the other thing. Cause you know, I mean the, the traditional, the old, the old saying, I don't know if it's an old saying, but it's what I, what I tell people is, you know, if something is nutrient dense, it's often got less calories. If something is calorie yeah. dense, it often has less nutrients. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Yeah. And, and you're gonna you're gonna hit the satiety break earlier with nutrient dense foods, and you're gonna hit more nutrients 
hit that break with more nutrients, you're going to yeah. get more satiety. But like you said before, you want to find that balance between nutrients and energy. If you're a bulking bodybuilder or a triathlete, mm-hmm. you're going to need the less nutrient dense food so you can get more fuel. But if you're one of the growing majority of people who have got plenty of stored fuel, you need to move it in the other direction. Right. Okay. So let's talk about bioavailability a little bit. Do you have in your data, does it show the impact of preparing foods different ways? I've looked at it like looked at a lot lately, but I was starting to look at the different nutrients and the bliss points for different nutrients. And I think lower carb has a lower bliss point for calcium just because it's more on a lower carb diet because it's potentially more bioavailable because you're getting it from dairy rather than plant-based foods. Mm -hmm. So there may be a a slightly lower absolute requirement for some nutrients because they're more bioavailable, but it's not a massive change from what I've seen so far. What about specifically we talk about the same foods but just prepared differently? Let's say um, cabbage. If someone's eating a meal of cabbage and whatever they're getting out of cabbage is probably isn't the best example Mm. because there ain't really anything in cabbage, but let's say, uh, (laughs) let's say, let's say spinach, right? Let's say someone's eating fresh spinach versus steamed spinach versus, I don't know if any, if anybody does this, but fermented spinach or they do something else to it. And, you know, cause you know, what I hear a lot by, there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, fermented veggies is the way to go. If you want to break it down and get the most of the Mm. nutrition that's in there out. Have you, have you seen, do you track it, the differences yeah, in how the foods are prepared? I, I don't have data and I'm not massive on fermenting, but if you cook the spinach, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons of if you cook the spinach and it loses all the water and you pour that water off, you're going to lose a lot of the nutrients that were in that food. But you're supposed to drink time, the can, water, man. Well, maybe you do if you're hardcore, but <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how much spinach you eat, but uh, it's probably not a lot. But uh, mm. But you're going to be able to eat more of that cooked food. I mean, we invented fire, we invented cooking so we could get more nutrition, we can get more nutrients and we can Mm -hmm. consume more of it. You don't eat a lot of raw meat, eat a lot more when it's cooked. You you don't eat a lot of raw. You're going to piss off the raw people now. I uh, know they're, they're probably lean because they can't eat a lot of the raw stuff. You might eat yeah. more of the cooked stuff. Um, and that's, that's an interesting hack. And there's a lot of, you know, if, if I gave you nothing but raw carrots or raw veggies with no fat, you'd, you'd probably be lean pretty quickly if mm-hmm. that's all you had to eat. Yeah. But I mean, if you need more nutrients, then cooking can be helpful to get more of that into you. Although per gram, per calorie you're probably going to lose some of the nutrients in the cooking process so it's a bit of a it's pros and cons yeah okay yeah now and we've talked a lot about satiety what are some so that what are some other things you know you we talked about the bliss point you said there's some things there that you you're really hot on you mentioned earlier the tobacco companies getting into food yeah yeah do you have enough information to talk on that a little bit and educate people on you know, what happened when cigarettes went away, it, air quotes, and they yeah. said, well, crap, how can, we, how can we keep making money? Yeah, they basically saw the writing on the wall and, and um, uh, Salt, Sugar, Fat tells the story of, and, and the follow-up book Hooked by Michael Moss um, that I'm reading at the moment, um, tells the story of how individuals started suing the tobacco companies, but they really went, oh, we're, we're screwed. Mm-hmm. We've got to pivot when... Um, Government's 42 U.S. states sued them for the cost of smoking on the health system. I think it was $342 million or something for a year's worth of medical costs, yeah. which is a massive amount of money. And they went, okay, we're, we're in trouble here. We you know, would gear up with Kraft and General Foods and these other things and sort of use the same, we're just going to maximize bliss point dopamine addiction behavior to make, to make foods that people want to buy more of. So... Mm-hmm. They're hitting, they're engineering these foods for maximum palatability, minimum cost with negligible nutrition. And and I think potentially the fortification is just enough nutrition to get the minimum to hit the bliss point. So you go, oh, wow, this this food is not bland. It's palatable. It's tolerable. And I'm going to keep on chowing down on my cocoa pops and fruit loops so i'm not gonna yep. go go well those b vitamins are actually in the steak and seafood i'm gonna go over there and 
you know, eat a steak. You just said a word that was in my head that I, that I was going to ask you to talk about, and that was fortification. So when we, this is something I saw, um, gosh, maybe three months ago on an, an Instagram channel. Are you familiar? I think it's, I think his name is Greg McCloskey. He's a health and fitness coach yeah, influencer right. out there who's got a lot of good stuff. And he did a thing where he took frosted, was it um, cornflakes? Yeah. He took cornflakes, right? Ground it all up in a blender, put it in a bowl. Mm. Um, and then I think he put it in water. I think he put it in water and then took a magnet and moved the magnet around and then pulled off all the iron filings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that, that bioavailable? Right? Probably not. But they yeah, can but put it on the label that it's iron. great. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. So what, what is, what, have you seen other examples of things like that? Like, the yeah, things, if, I mean, if we have to put it in there, that doesn't mean our body is actually getting it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, the bioavailability thing is interesting, and synthetic nutrients are not in the form and ratios that your body really understands and wants. It's just you can put it on the label and it looks good, and you can brag that it's a great source of B vitamins and iron. And going back to the book, it was an interesting. He told the story of they went to Kellogg's and, and they said, "Look, we'll make you a a zero salt cornflakes and it was just unpalatable but not only was it unpalatable it was metallic because they could taste the iron and all the b vitamin supplements that were really awful if you didn't cover it with all the salt <laughs> yeah and you're going why the hell are they putting all like, why are kellogg's going out of their way to put synthetic b vitamins in everything they sell is it is it just for our health is it you know just to prevent nutrient deficiency maybe maybe not maybe they know something that you know beyond just the sugar salt fat list points there's mm -hmm. other nutrients that we have more subtle cravings for that if it's not in the food we're going to go mm, this is awful i'm not going to buy it but every energy drink every processed food with a barcode and 30 ingredients half of those are nice and riboflavin and iron and b5 and b6 and it's yeah and then the data shows you know that gives us clues to go yeah. well are those statistically significant satiety factors and yeah b2 pops up as a, a satiety factor that it adds to the accuracy of just protein and potassium and calcium and salt and, and fat. You've got me thinking about my taste buds in a completely different way. <laughs> They're amazing. We don't understand them. We, right? that, that's the thing. They, they don't, like Howie Moskowitz and all the start of the food science engineering movement and just said, we don't know why we like food, but if we mm -hmm. gather data, we can understand how to engineer food perfectly to hit those yeah. list points. You can't yeah. tell me why you like steak more than spinach yeah. necessarily or, or this food versus that food. And and like in the experiments, they're, um, they're getting five-year-old kids to taste 25 different puddings in pear testing to see which sugar they like. And they go, they, they, they don't ask them to tell the researchers which one they like. They say, which one would Big Bird like? Which one would the Big Bird doll like versus uh, versus Oscar the Grouch? And the one they like, mm -hmm. they give to Big Bird because they like right. Big Bird. They like and they Big find Bird. the perfect <laughs> list point for sugar and salt and fat for these five-year-old kids so they can market snackables and whatever to to make more money it's just you know wow. it's precise engineering of ultra processed foods and if you go why yeah. do i feel addicted to mcdonald's has any has anybody come out and and stated yet or come out and just kind of put it out there and say look our taste buds are picking up more than flavor they're actually detecting levels of nutrition in the food that we're eating. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Because that's how I'm feeling right now. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's, that's what I'm getting out of this. Nutrition is a really young science. And, you know, Robin Harman and Simpson have been talking about protein leverage for a while. And um, Michael Tordoff has been talking a lot about um, calcium. And there's indications that we can taste calcium. And, you know, when we're calcium deficient, we crave that taste to some degree and you know mm. his stories of pregnant mothers who crave all sorts of weird and wacky things and elephants who go salt mining and but we just nutrition is a really young science and that's why i'm fascinated yeah. to go give me give me a million days of data dude and i can mine it i can decode it to help you know what to avoid that's step mm -hmm. one yeah and then what what do we eat now to be less addicted while nourishing our bodies that's step yeah. two yeah what are 
let's let's leave our listeners with um, a tip or two on what are the things they can take away that they can start doing now to maximize those three factors of good nutrition, um, nutrient density, bioavailability, and satiety. Everything you pick up, read the labels. If it's a combination of refined seed oils with added salt and vitamins, and uh, it's really the, the, the seed oils, um, refined sugar and, and carbs with a whole lot of added fortified nutrients that is the big warning sign that that food has been designed for maximum profit with no consideration for your health, nutrition or satiety or body composition. If you care about your health, avoiding pre-diabetes, just you know, avoid those foods. It's not, it's not the seed, it's not the poofers or it's not the seed oils per se. It's just they've used seed oils to perfectly hit your bliss points and um, make you feel addicted at minimum cost. It's, it's a money making, it's a profit sharing. Um, it's a, it's, yeah, it's just profit. It's all for profit. Yeah. So, yeah. um, that, that wasn't a, a, a dot point, but, um, yeah, prioritize protein. <laughs> and once you've find the right, found the right balance between protein and energy, go for the other nutrients and say, am I getting enough calcium? Am I getting enough potassium? Am I getting mm-hmm. enough, all these other nutrients and it's just fun from there and you go, I'm nourishing my body and it food tastes so luxurious and full flavored and I'm not hungry anymore and I'm eating much less calories or atoms or carbon carbon yeah. bonds or whatever Bronson wants to call it. <laughs> Sorry about that, man. I just call it macros. I just say, look, it's because uh, when I work with people, I just say, look, how much fat are you eating? How much carbs yeah. are you eating? How much protein are you eating? That's what I that's what I track. That's what I focus on. And you just need to find that that right balance for you. Yeah. And uh, if yeah. if you got body fat to lose, it's dial back the carbs and fat and prioritize protein. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Where can people find you, Marty? Dude, um, um, yeah, Google Marty Kendall or Optimizing Nutrition. Uh, we've got I've been a lot on probably too much on Twitter lately, having a lot of fun. Um, but we've, I've got a blog, which has got a ton of blog posts where I share the longer thoughts, but we've got a community in Mighty Networks that has now got 10,000 people of, Ooh, that's awesome. who are passionate about optimizing their nutrition and, and nourishing their body. And, um, yeah, so that's a really good place with a whole lot of food lists and free recipes and, uh, our courses that we guide people through to dial in the blood sugars and macros and micros which is what that's I do. Awesome, man. That's awesome. All right, cool. And um, I, if anybody's interested, I will put our first video in the description of this as well. And then, um, you know, everybody, I highly recommend go check Marty out. He's got some good stuff. Thanks, and dude. if you're interested in reading about this stuff, his blog has tons of information that's very detailed, <laughs> almost as if it was written by an engineer. <laughs> almost. almost. An engineer who needs to get on YouTube and just like share it. Awesome, like man. Do, All right. So, Thank you very yeah. much for being on. I appreciate it. Thanks, dude.